Arrived at the meal late? Want another course? Check out thefeedpodcast.com for more information about all of our shows and bonus segments. One of the things you notice after spending so many years in this business is how chefs write their menus. I think too often owners don't realize how important this document is. It is a map of sorts, right? It certainly is a map, but it has changed so much through the years that Frontera has been open. We started off in the era of the very wordy menu so that almost every dish had a full paragraph. Um, I remember going to a very famous restaurant in Dallas during that era. and uh, it was Owned by a, somebody with the initials of DF? No, it oh. was, it, no, it, not that. Okay, it was, SP? It, no, it was actually the, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, it's the mansion on Turtle Creek. Okay. And, that was uh, Dean Fearing. Oh, but he didn't own it. Oh, okay. No, no, he All was right. working for the group that, that owns gotcha. that whole thing. Okay. That was before he went out on his own. Gotcha. But it had this full full paragraph description down to not just the varietal of the wine, but the varietal, the vineyard, the the um, the date that it was harvested. I mean, the whole thing. And it was by the time you got through the description of one dish, you kind of just had to order it because you didn't have any more energy to go through the rest of the menu. And that was at the height of all of that kind of thing. Now we're down to this crazy thing where sort of three disparate words are listed and you're supposed to make heads or tails of it. Like I saw something the other day that was pigeon, cacao, mustard. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like... That's uh, not helpful. No. (laughs) And it sounds like somebody's shopping list or something, but you can't imagine how that all goes together. So we've gone from one end of the spectrum now to Uh another. Well, coming up on today's show, a behind-the-scenes look at how chefs write their menus from casual to high-end and some tips for budding restaurateurs who might be writing their own one day soon. I'm going to weigh in on the subject, then we'll talk to the chef of a two-star Michelin restaurant about how he approaches his menu writing. And finally, a chef from a vegetable-centric or vegetable-forward restaurant telling us how he gets his customers excited using words to convey a feeling and even more importantly, flavor. Stay with us. The wordsmiths are upon us in the kitchen and out in the dining room. This is The Feed Podcast. I'm Steve Dolinsky, a food and travel reporter at ABC7 News, the Chicago Tribune, and Canada's Globe and Mail. And I'm Rick Bayless, the chef and owner of Chicago's Frontera Grill, Topolo Bampo, Choco Leña Brava, and the host of Public Television's Mexico, one plate at a time. And every week, The Feed takes a deep dive into the world of professional chefs, restaurateurs, food artisans, and drink experts, sharing their stories and uncovering their passion for food and drink. But that's not all. Rick and I are always traveling the globe for our jobs, eating, drinking, and immersing ourselves in the local culture. And if we find something exciting along the way, you can be sure it's going to find its way here to our James Beard Award-winning podcast. Well, the job of taking seasonal ingredients and making them into delicious dishes isn't so easy, but the work begins well before they start cooking. First, They have to write the menu, not just writing it, but there are issues like font choice, color of type, the size of the letters. All these factors help lead or in some cases confuse the diner. Menus ideally should set clear expectations. It can be tough to do that when working with ingredients that might be unfamiliar to customers, though. Do you choose to list them on the menu and risk confusing people or omit them altogether, not explaining the dish fully? Or do you choose to use more familiar synonyms? So my co-host has a few restaurants and kiosks bearing his name. So we're going to start with you. Um, Let's talk about this. We've got uh, in our first segment, um, you've got... Well, I take take issue with one thing that you've already said, that you start with writing the menu copy. No one ever starts writing the menu copy. You start creating the dish, and then you translate the dish into the menu copy. And um, I teach classes in this because I have so many chefs that are creating dishes, so I have to teach them how to write menu copy. So my rules are always this, that you start by listing the thing that the person thinks they're buying, which in our culture usually is the protein. So say we got a pork chop, okay? Then I say the next thing has to be the main flavor of the dish. So in our restaurants, that might be a mole. So you would describe the mole. 
but you would describe it short in in a short way. You don't have to give away that it's got 27 ingredients and try to list them on the menu. You pick out one or two or three of those ingredients to focus on. The third thing that you list is the 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 ringer, the thing that's gonna that sounds really cool that that people are gonna go oh and it's got that in it, whatever that would be. And then you are at three. Now max is seven. You can't list any more than seven ingredients because the human brain, this is what I learned in graduate school 100 years ago, was the the brain cannot process more than seven things. So you want to get out at six because that still leaves the guest sort of fresh. Um, And you list them in sort of descending order of importance in the dish. If you find something that is really unusual, like for us, the uh, herb hoja santa, I will put the word herby before it so that they will know it's an herb. So herby hoja santa. Or if we've got black sapote in a dish, I will say tropical black sapote so that they kind of have an idea it might be a tropical fruit. I try to keep the menu descriptions short and impactful in going just in the order of the way I think that our guests are going to be able to process everything. So that's usually an hour-long class. I've just given it to you in about a minute Minutes. and a half. Well, I'm gonna t- I've got the Topolo, Topolo Bampo lunch menu yes. here. You do you do a thing at the top, Topolo and 60. Right. So you choose a starter, a main, and a dessert, and it's in a box. So I look at that and I say, oh, three courses for 25 wine pairings, 25 extra. And you've got appetizers, more starters, and main courses. And kind of going with what you were talking about just now, so from one of the starters here, creamy pumpkin tamal, goat cheese, black walnut. That's the headline. Right. Um, so I know that this creamy tamal. People maybe probably know what a tamal is. That's right. not a very difficult thing. We know goat cheese and black walnut. And then underneath that, polenta-style roasted pumpkin tamal. Okay, there you've clarified that. I clarified it. Black walnut ajillo sauce. Okay. And then parenthetically after that, local serrano seco roasted garlic dwarf basil. So I'm telling you what's in that sauce because you might not know what an ajillo sauce is. And I'm going to give you three ingredients that go in it. Then it's rooftop pak choy. Not bok choy, but pak choy. Mm-hmm. That rooftop, I'm guessing, is either the restaurants or the restaurants. The restaurants. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Rooftop okay. pak choy. Creamy goat cheese. You've, again, you clarify what kind of goat cheese it's creamy pickled Cortland apple and then inside after that parenthetically tequila lemon geranium that was inside that app infused into that apple okay yeah so there's a lot of description there's more than seven things no well it's only there's seven things that are main things but then okay. I kind of use parenthesis to add more clarity or in some cases more interest got it so sometimes you put the word tequila in a minute like that and people go oh it's gonna be boozy i mean there's just a little bit infused into the apple but still people sometimes will will hearken to that i've noticed in your menus you also you do a lot of things like you know if it's wood fired or wood roasted or wood grilled right you want to make sure that you're conveying a sense of like how this has been prepared i think that's always very attractive to guests to know how it's cooked so instead of just listing the protein a lot of times i will tell you how we cook that protein is it on a wood grill is it braised um all of those things conjure up something for our guests, and hopefully it will conjure up something that they don't normally do at their home. Uh, I want to make sure that they understand that what we are doing in our restaurants is unique. Hmm. Um, do you tend to, like Topolo is obviously your jewel, do you tend to dial that a lot further down for like Shoko or for a, a I, well Shoko's Shoko is a different thing because it's quick service so we have menus that are printed but you're standing in line and you may be asked by the cashier right away what do you want so I keep it super punchy but you have to in this day and age especially make sure that if there's something that's a major allergen that you have listed it in the description so that if you are gluten sensitive or or lactose intolerant, or have a nut allergy, or a shellfish allergy, that we have made sure that we have told you that in the menu description. Do you ever put, sometimes I'll see like an asterisk on the menu, it'll say like if you are gluten-free or lactose, but that's not like a key you know, to put on the menu? I, I don't, we we mark vegetarian stuff, but that's the only thing that we do, because sometimes it's unclear on our menu whether it, it might be vegetarian or not. Um, you know, my love for pork fat, so mm-hmm. there might be pork fat <laughs> in 
something that has a lot of vegetables in it. Um, and it might be sprinkled with bacon, which I have also been known to do. So uh, we just mark everything that's truly vegetarian, but it doesn't have to be vegan. So the most important lesson you've learned over the years of writing all these menus for so many of your restaurants, um, something that's really stood out for you is beyond the seven you know, limit yes. of seven things. Like what have you really taken um, that you continue to use today? Um, I will say that it's all about the key words. So yes, I just told you sort of in a general way how we do things, but then some words are sexier than others. And so um, to me, a lot of times when I'm talking about things that are cooked slowly over a wood fire, um, that just like melts people. Okay. So if you get something also seared in a really hot pan, because no one will do it at home. So if it's got seared till it's crusted... The other interesting thing that has come up recently that's a sexy word is charred. And used to, like 20 years ago, if we put the word chard on it, no one would order it. Also, in the past, we had to be very careful with the word smoky because used to people didn't like smoky. They thought it was overwhelming. Now we put that a, a, a roasted tomato sauce has smoky chipotle chilies in it, and they go, yeah, that's what I want. So smoky has become a sexy word, too. So that's what I pay attention to is, like, what's in fashion right now? And um, if it's not in fashion, I just leave the words out. Out. And if it is in fashion, I, I put them in. Did moist ever come back in fashion? Well, this is a very interesting thing. I love the word moist. And I well, know cakes, people yeah. say, yeah, for cakes, for sure. Um, but there are some other places where it doesn't sound dirty. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> it's, I mean, a moist cake. Come on. I want a moist coffee. You do want cake. a moist. Yeah. There's other moist things you want yeah. in your life, too. Okay. All right. Well, good. All right. Coming up next, the chef and owner of the two Michelin starred Oriole restaurant stops by to talk about how he constructed his tasting menu. Then later, the chef of the Vegetable Forward restaurant, Bad Hunter, drops by to share some of his menu writing philosophy. Stay with us. Have a beef with something you heard? Looking for a little extra side dish? Let us know on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at The Feed Podcast. See photos, get links to previous stories, or just let us know what you think. Contact us on our website, thefeedpodcast.com. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Noah Sandoval had a pretty good 2017 in the spring. The Chicago Tribune named him Chef of the Year. In the summer, he was one of the Food & Wine magazine's best new chefs. And in the fall, his restaurant, Oriole, was awarded two Michelin stars. Sandoval has worked at restaurants such as Senza, a gluten-free restaurant that also garnered a Michelin star, Green Zebra, and Schwa. And in his 14-course menu is a study in restraint with such dishes as Beausoleil Oyster with Mangalitsa's consomme, smoked finger lime, and borage, or Alaskan king crab with aguachile, chicharrones, and wild oregano. Here to talk about how he writes his menus, Noah Sandoval. Welcome to the feed, sir. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Congratulations (laughs) on an amazing 2017. Oh, that's so nice of you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is great. It's a very big year for you. Um, I want to talk about your menu. I've got one here. I've made a copy of it, um, and it goes right down the middle of the page. And this is—it's always a tasting menu, right? Uh, always, yeah. Okay, fourteen. Fourteen to sixteen. We've been up to eighteen before, but it kind of gets a little hairy then. Okay, so uh, well, Rick was talking earlier in the show about you know he thinks that uh, well he was taught in grad school seven things are the maximum number of things people can remember or process. So you've got well under seven here for each yes. one. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you can forget seven of these. I'd be fine, you know. <laughs> you can forget it's, it oh yeah i mean you said you need just seven right right well, so the, would, the other seven they can forget and that'd be oh no, they're no, only good no, about no i'm saying ways. per item yeah per oh, so, so oh, let's gotcha, say or gotcha, king gotcha, salmon yeah, there's yeah. one item mm-hmm. it's a hand roll with smoked roe and gen mai right so yeah. again not everybody knows what gen mai is or even what roe mm-hmm. is so how how much do you have to educate teach your staff to be ambassadors for what your vision is oh. uh most of them i've worked in really like nice restaurants before and get get it all you know um but i guess we kind of train them to uh answer questions as best they can like again my explain what that is and explain explain what row is and things like that they're very well equipped um before they even get to the table well and the experience at your restaurant is very very high touch there's somebody by your table at every minute that can answer questions and uh, what I remember from having eaten there sort of gloriously uh, was the fact that 
any time that somebody approached our table, they had, and it wasn't sort of like stratification and you would say, oh, let me get your server for that. Everybody mm-hmm. knew everything. So I think that's a very unique way of approaching the service in a dining room. Yeah, my wife, Kara, runs the dining room mm-hmm. and pretty much everything um, that we do at the restaurant and even some of the food, uh, she's she's really, really good at it. And she's mm-hmm. really new at it too. She, her first restaurant job was at um, at Senza. So mm-hmm. she's gotten, she's come a long way really, really quickly. And nice. uh, yeah, it, it, it helps. One of the things they teach us in journalism school is about, you know, writing to your audience, understanding who your audience is. And when you're writing your menu, I'm always curious when I ask chefs this, who, who are you thinking your audience is? Is someone who's going to know Quince and Oxalis? Mm-hmm. Or is it someone who is just super curious and you can't wait to tell them and teach them what everything is? Because clearly you're writing this. I mean, not, you know, sea grapes. I mean, I'm looking mm-hmm. at the key words here and a very few, I think a small percentage of the population will know what all these things are. Right. I try to keep it, I, you know, I try to use uh, interesting ingredients as much as I can, but those ingredients also have to be delicious, you know? So mm-hmm. I think that sea grapes are, are briny and, 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 and delicious. And I think that most people will as well. Um, but do you ever think that you're sort of putting off your customers because you put sea grapes on there and 95% of them won't know what sea grapes are? That's why we don't give them a menu. They have to look online at first, which I guess they can do that. But we wait till the end. You know, we're like, Here, here's your menu and this is all the weird stuff you ate. Uh, I th- think you liked it. You know? Now, that's <laughs> a very, very interesting approach. And I know a number of restaurants that do that. They won't mm-hmm. give you a menu ahead of time. Just say, here, mm-hmm. taste this. It's going to be delicious. And that I'm in the day of that we live in now where everybody's got some food allergy or whatever. Um, why do you take that approach? It seems like it would be um, almost cavalier because so <laughs> many people tell you exactly what they will and won't eat. We are very malleable with the menu. Mm-hmm. If we, we call, we have like a questionnaire online. Um, we, we call, I think twice um, to confirm, make sure the reservations are, are, are the uh, restrictions are there and we can pretty much deal with whatever. Um, mm-hmm. We don't, necessarily do like vegan we can't do vegan <laughs> no but but no, honestly um a that, whole that's tasting menu of vegan you can't do it yeah we have really a really good um really good return customers repeat guests and uh people that we really are just friends with at this point um and we have uh one of them coming in tomorrow and they're bringing her their daughter and i think she's a vegan we were like okay for you we'll do it you know, mm-hmm. we can't do it for everybody it, just, it would drive w- us crazy when somebody is calling to double check everything and they mm-hmm. see call twice I'm guessing sometimes people show up and then there is a variable and someone says, oh, I didn't tell you that I can't eat, you know, shellfish. Yeah. Did that happen that, last minute too? That, absolutely. Every, okay. I mean, once a day, somebody we, will We come, had somebody uh, become a vegetarian halfway through their meal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know whether it was what we served them yeah. or that they, they had no more meat. It's, I was hoping that wasn't it. It's because the vegetables were so like, good. Oh, that's, that's what, what it was. was. Promise, okay, yeah, thank you. So because you give the menu to them at the end of the meal, you don't really have to worry about, I mean, writing to try to entice them. No, because no. right, this is just sort of a document of what what their experience was. You're, these yep. people are trusting you with their evening. Exactly, and if somebody comes in and we, we make all the menus ahead of time, and there's, there's no menus the same at night. It seems like I mean, obviously they are, but um, it's really nice to be able to just kind of go downstairs, change the menu if something if somebody doesn't like something, you have to send them out something else, which is rare. But mm-hmm. you know, it's 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 very customizable. But so if you've got a four top that comes in and somebody's made the reservation and they say, no, no restrictions at all, you make their menu for them. And then the four top comes in and somebody who didn't make the reservation says, oh, you know, there's like 16 things I don't eat. Yeah. And do you have to run down and reprint their menus and Absolutely. all of that? Absolutely. You have to go no. through all of that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's we, we take pride in that kind of stuff, yeah. though. I mean, we... we it's not that we welcome it, but it's uh, it's it it's, it goes. In, we try to take as many steps to make people happy as we can, and, and mm-hmm. that's one of them. So clearly, um, I'm looking at the, again. Sort of, there's a headline for each one of these items. It's mm-hmm. you know, it's Ocetra caviar, or it's Spanish mackerel, or it's Alaskan king crab, and then you kind of build around that. Exactly. I think that's it's cliche at this point to say you know it's all about the ingredients, but it's the truth. I mean, mm-hmm. you, if you find one good ingredient that you really love and you feel inspired by. There's no need to do too much to it. Are you a finger lime guy? Because everybody's using finger limes I've now. been using finger limes since yeah. I even knew what they were. It's like my favorite thing. They're unbelievable. Yeah. I just had them in Australia. I, yeah. I'm guessing Rod Marcus in Chicago is the guy that people get finger limes from. Yes, absolutely. I get, I mean, if, if Rod wasn't in this in this city, I would... I wouldn't. I wouldn't be good at my <laughs> Isn't job. Isn't that interesting? I know yeah. he's he's made so many yeah. people successful because of his ability to get to, to, to procure things. I, I go up to see him, and it's like an idea factory. Mm-hmm. I mean, you go up there and you walk through his little. He's like, "Smell this. Here you go," and you're just like, 
This is you have a whole new menu in your head, you know. Yeah, this is a company called Rare Tea Cellars right. yeah. uh, in Chicago, and Rod Marcus is kind of that guy that people say I got a guy. He's yeah. the guy who's finding the sea grapes or whatever, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So I'm just curious. So you see, we talked about sea grape. So how do you get the idea? I'm going to pair it with Spanish mackerel and Asian pear and seaweeds. Um, that's actually a dish that my chef de cuisine put on recently. Um, he's starting to get into the more of the collaboration with me instead of just doing what I say all the time. I mean, he's been working with me for a long time. Um, so he'd have to speak for that, but I would assume it's because of the brininess of, of all the other ingredients. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of just has a visual and a, a texture, and a, you know, it's it's. I think it fits in with a lot of different things. And I notice when we were talking, Rick, about how you love to say this is wood grilled or charred mm-hmm. or smoky. There's none of that. I don't know how any of these things are prepared. Just looking back at this menu mm-hmm. that I maybe just ate an hour earlier, mm-hmm. does that? Is that a concern at all? Do you want to tell people, remind them how it was, it was poached or it was grilled or it was smoked? When I do it, I like to be consistent about it. And I have a hard time coming up with that many uh, adjectives. Mm-hmm. Or what is it? Is that an adjective? I don't know. I yeah. didn't go to high school. But um, I, I try to, I don't want to, I wouldn't want to repeat any of them. So it's hard to kind of come up with like 14 of different ones. I tried it for a little while. I'm just not that, not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> So you just you this, this is a th- the essential the bare yeah. bones just the yeah. item and then what it was served with yeah um, and that's a, pretty much everything on here is about half of what you're actually getting but I, I could put salt on all of them if you you know mm-hmm. if you really wanted salt or and no you know. farmers um, there's all kinds of farmers but I just you know do you say in the menu somewhere like you know obviously it would take too much time here to go on the menu to put yeah. them on on the items but yeah. do you say somewhere in the menu like we work with such and such the the descriptions on the menu and the descriptions at the server's kind of spiel is a, are two different things. They they definitely go about it a whole different way. They they research everything. You know, I give them, you know, the very specifics, but they they research every element of every course. And they know everything about it. You know, if we're getting blueberries from Michigan, they know that. You know, and they say that if they feel like it. We kind of let them off the leash a little mm-hmm. bit with that. And then how much how much time do you spend with the staff each day, kind of just going over menu? Um, if it changes, we go over it pretty heavily, but I'm really bad about that. I'll, I'll change something the last minute and, uh, Aaron will kill me. Um, and the staff's like, okay, what's this? I don't understand. I'm like, just tell them it's this. That's all you need to worry about. <laughs> all right. Well, that's very interesting. It's, um, I, that's not, it doesn't come across that you're cavalier about that at all. Just having <laughs> eaten there, <laughs> they really do research a lot of stuff and really yeah. know what it's all about. Um, that, that was one of the most impressive things for me eating there. Um, not only was the food unique and the combinations worked, um, they weren't just interesting, but they actually worked. Um, yeah. And then the the service staff was able to back it all up. It's, I'm really, really thankful for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you sat, I think your section, you sat on the the, the wall. I think yes. you had uh, Alex and John and their uh, professionals. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> more than so professionals. if people wanted to see what Oriole serves, they could go online and look at the menu or yes. sample a recent menu. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. But well, that's not exactly what they're going to... No. Yeah, they might yeah, get something right. completely different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Depending on what Rod has for you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> restaurant again is called Oriole. Noah yes. Sandoval is the chef and co-owner. Noah, thanks for coming in and congrats again on all the success. Thank, thank you so much. You. This is great. great. Great to have you here. Awesome. Thank you. All right. When we come back, uh, the chef from a much more casual restaurant joins us to talk about how he writes a menu with a lot more vegetables in a city that is unabashedly meat and potatoes. Stay with us. Listening to the Feed Podcast. To get your weekly fix, subscribe to us on iTunes or visit our website, thefeedpodcast.com. Still not full? Feast on the photos, recipes, and be a part of the conversation on Twitter at the Feed Podcast. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Uh, Dan Snowden began his Chicago career at the One Off Hospitality Group, working first as a line cook and then becoming kitchen supervisor at The Publican. He was a sous chef at Nico Osteria before leaving the company to become executive chef at Bad Hunter, a vegetable forward restaurant in Chicago's West Loop. His menu is economical in terms of word usage. There are few extraneous descriptions, and despite the number of farms he has to work with, he avoids name dropping within the dish descriptions. Take this item from a recent dinner menu. Acorn squash, roasted in embers, piloncillo, pasilla, panela. 
Here to talk more about how he crafts his menus, Dan Snowden. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, let's sure. talk about that dish. Yeah. Little corn squash roasted in embers. That makes sense to me. Okay. Sure. So you just you, you put some squash in the actual embers. Yep. Okay. And that roasted it. Exactly. And then the piloncillo is the sh- raw and refined sugar. It right? is. Right? Yeah. I'm looking I, at the Mexican chef. <laughs> um, piloncillo. But again, not everybody knows what piloncillo is, so they're going to ask questions. Exactly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I like to use a kind of a combination of descriptors that will i guess evoke a expectation for the guests as well as stuff that maybe they aren't familiar with um this dish is directly uh influenced from a trip to mexico city uh recently um during the day of the dead uh kind of holiday and i saw a lot of that um that like candied squash Mm -hmm. everywhere for the for the celebration Mm -hmm. and you know we're middle of midwest I mean, this time of year is just squash haven right so it made a lot of sense to me and and you know there's there is so many ingredients in that dish that it would it would be a paragraph if i were to list all of them so i picked kind of the few that i really wanted to um emphasize and and create the conversation with but not so only each other you've gotten three things in a row here mm-hmm. i love the alliteration thank you but, <laughs> um, <laughs> coincidental right uh it was a little thought went oh, into that okay. too <laughs> uh, all right okay piloncillo pasi and panela mm-hmm. okay so besides the alliteration um they're pretty unusual things for uh most of your diners i'm sure so do you ever sort of recoil from that or do you ever worry that that's going to make people just say oh i'm not going to have that dish it's got too many things that i don't know about you know i'm always taking risks i think as chefs we're we're constantly challenging ourselves Mm -hmm. to improve and um i think connecting kind of something that's very understandable to most people which is acorn squash um two maybe three things that they've never heard of before not only does it create conversation with each other at the table Mm -hmm. and really open up that like communal sense of what dining out with each other is but it it really does open up uh opportunity for the the servers to to describe and and help kind of get through kind of my my uh mindset when i was coming up with the dish and share the story that would be again way too long to to right to describe it but have you ever found or you have you ever suspected that menu copy um was related to how a dish sells or doesn't sell absolutely um being kind of in the school of paul khan he was always you know coaching us through writing Mm -hmm. menus and and how to describe things and um you know i working at nico was a uh a time where I I wanted to push the envelope and educate people about Italian cuisine and true Italian words for things. And, you know, it it scares people away sometimes and you have to show restraint in that department. Um, I think at Bad Hunter, it's already kind of a out of your comfort zone kind of dining experience so because um, of the vegetable yeah, the the vegetable forward, it's 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 unusual enough. You're you're I think expecting to kind of be like, all right, show me something wow me with something so mm-hmm. i i'm i'm lately have been pushing the envelope a little bit more with descriptors and um you know so your menu is set up with. where you have most of the like the vegetable dishes all together and then you have a specials card if i'm remembering everything right that yeah. has meat dishes on it so that it's not 100% veg- vegetable food right um that was the whole thing when we opened the restaurant. We, we never wanted to be a vegetarian restaurant. Mm-hmm. It was never about, let's say, a dietary restriction when we were coming up with the concept. It was out of a sheer love for vegetables and, mm-hmm. and wanting to, to highlight them as the star. So the idea of separating out the proteins was really important to us. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the challenging part there is I didn't want the guests to think that they're going to get a steak entree like your traditional sized right, entree. Right. So that was the the concept behind kind of separating those menus out a little bit. Um, and there are sections here. I'm looking at this dinner menu. There's snacks, mm-hmm. there's bread, mm-hmm. and there's plants, pasta, and protein, and then dessert, of course. Mm-hmm. So you know that this plant section, and there's one, three, six, seven items here mm-hmm. that are plants, and there's a lot of snacks, too. You probably could just do plants and snacks. Yeah. Right? Um, I chose the bread section because I think a, a meal – almost always should start with some sort of breaking of bread that kind of that ceremonial mm-hmm. like let's let's break down the the walls between us and and become a community become a you know um 
you know, in, interact with each other. Um, so I love starting a meal with bread in general. But the um, only types, I mean, I don't, again, we're talking about the, the char sure. and the grilled. I only see pickled, yeah. usually pickled onions, pickled blueberry. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily know, although the acorn squash is roasted. No, and that's not roasted. But it's cooked in it's the cooked ambers, in ambers <laughs> right. which is another, like I, were, I was talking about earlier about the word charred hmm. and how that's become a sexy word. Um, in the embers is all about that. Mm-hmm. I also, <laughs> cooking with wood fire, you're going to get some char yeah. on it. You're going to get some burn on it. And it's actually completely intentional. The, the bitterness that the, the wood char is a different flavor than gas char. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that it actually adds to the dish. So for me, that, that choice, not only does it sound pretty cool, it also um, gets that expectation in the diner's head where they're going to expect it to be a little blackened um, and not you know, be offended by that. Thanks. See, the thing that, I, that catches my eye, I see parsnip chow and mushi. Mm-hmm. Now, I know a lot of my friends don't know what chow and mushi is. Sure. Um, so how do you get someone to get excited about, you know, egg custard? I, it's something that excites me. I don't know. I, I, I love it. And um, You just hope they're curious. Your guests think, are curious yeah. enough. They're going to ask. Well, exactly. Or that the service staff will say, exactly. oh, you got to have this dish. You know, that sells more than anything else. Even if it's filled with all kinds of words you don't know, if a server says, this, this dish on the menu is just amazing, people are more likely to order that than pretty much all the stuff that they recognize. So that only happens if you have a great tasting with the staff during right, family sure. meal? or before. Absolutely. So does that happen how often? We do a daily um, pre-shift meeting, and we'll taste anything that's yeah. new, discuss anything. We'll revisit old dishes if, if it's been a while. Right. Because you want to blow your staff away so that they go out and hand sell it. Exactly. Okay. It's all about um, that. Yeah. That and we call it at the restaurant, we call it the, like the Chili's effect. To, you know, you walk through the restaurant with a plate of, you know, steaming fajitas. <laughs> People <laughs> order the fajitas. In fact, you call it the Chili's yeah, effect. Yeah, it's, it's Not the Applebee's effect. Or <laughs> Applebee's, whatever, either one. Um, uh, and great. there's a few dishes that, that are kind of show-stopping when you see them walking through right. the dining room. And, uh, for example, the, the acorn squash, we, we toast. Um, we actually char some cinnamon on the plate. So it's kind of smoking through the, the restaurant mm-hmm. and, like, just brings this, like, amazing smell to the restaurant. And people are like, what is that? We want that. Yeah. Um, so that, that helps sell it. Um, the, the parsnip is very... Uh, ornate looking and interesting. That's, got, that's yeah. also got grilled forest mushrooms mm-hmm. and smoked pecans and mm-hmm. then puffed nori. Yep. You, you puff the seaweed? We actually make a rice cracker with uh, a good portion of seaweed in mm-hmm. the rice cracker and mm-hmm. then fry it and it's like a big chicharron right. kind of looking thing on top. Right, right, that right, sounds right, good. Right. That's yeah. pretty good. This is a, it's, it's, I have used the technique that you call the chilies technique <laughs> when a dish is not selling and mm-hmm. I really want it to sell to just make one and then parade it all the way through the dining room and all the way back because once people see it you're exactly right they that's what they want and it will even those servers can usually get somebody to order it um, it's just much better if they can see or smell it but it's, yeah it's got to be dramatic and it's it got to you got to be able to smell it from a few feet away right. Sure, right desserts that's a big deal with desserts oh yeah it, it, uh, people are full. They, they, they're like, eh, maybe we don't need maybe dessert. Maybe you don't need yeah. dessert until they see it. And they it, see it and they're like, all right, yeah, they that's what I need. That. Is there anything on your, I'm looking at your dessert menu right now. You've got, a, again, about seven mm-hmm. items here. Mm-hmm. Um, anything that you feel like uh, you know, you've worked hard on and you really, it's been selling well because of the either way, the way it's written or the way that the staff has been selling it for you? Um, my pastry chef, Emily Sperlin, she's fantastic, and I wouldn't be, you know, where I'm at without her. Um, the thing that surprised me the most is the coconut tapioca. Mm-hmm. Growing up as a kid, I thought tapioca was gross, and as I've gotten older, I've really grown to love it. Mm-hmm. Um, it to me, it it kind of reads maybe not as like enticing as some of the other ones, but it sells so much, and I I don't really know what it is that's <laughs> selling it. I like think it does. it's your service staff, and I think because it is. I had it the last yeah. time that I was there, and I had it. I happened to, I grew up eating tapioca mm-hmm. um, and I loved it, but it wasn't cold. We always ate tapioca warm mm. just when it was made and wow. it had folded egg whites, beaten egg whites in it. So it was really light. So nonetheless, when I see tapioca, that's what I think mm. of. So I'm drawn to it, but the server sold it to us, said, no, you got to have that. And so and, we said, yeah. And okay. I'm drawn to hibiscus. Mm-hmm. Uh, Respado, isn't that the ice, the sort of scraped yeah, ice? I'm like not, granita? Shaved ice. Shaved exactly. Ice. Yeah, yeah okay. we basically do like a hibiscus granita oh, with nice. it. It's, it's, a, it's a 
great dish and it's a it's a great uh, restaurant thank you i've really enjoyed being there. it is and and it's out of the box too i think what you guys are doing the way that you're approaching things you've created a world a window for yourself that's different than other people's windows and i think that that is really important because um just like any city we get a lot of the same restaurant opening if one's successful then somebody will open something very similar to it but you guys are really thinking differently about food and the way to present it which i think is really cool uh one question is it's you've always put out there that it's vegetable forward Mm -hmm. okay so do the vegetarians come in and they're all pissed off because it's not vegetarian enough that was something that really struck us when we opened um and it was shocking to me that we were pissing off <laughs> vegans and vegetarians. I was like, it doesn't surprise yeah. me at all. And, and it's because we weren't strictly yeah. dogmatically right. vegetarian or vegan. And uh, none, nothing that we planned out said that we were going to be or, or implied that even, I thought. Well, press that's written about you has been saying vegetable forward. Yeah, that's right. the thing. Yeah. Right? Well, and that's what it is. In this day and age, there are many of us that love to eat vegetables, but we're not vegetarian. And yeah. we love going to places like Bad Hunter because we can get all of these vegetable dishes. And if right. we want to eat meat, we can eat meat there too. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine who is a very famous author, mostly writing vegetarian cookbooks, <laughs> she just she's not vegetarian but she's been very successful at it. And she says that it's so hard for her because she will have people tell her that they can't buy her cookbook because they're not vegetarian. And she just looks at them <laughs> wide-eyed and says, you don't eat any vegetables? <laughs> and because it's it, we have made this dichotomy in yep. our country that yeah. you're vegetarian or not vegetarian. Right. But actually, our vegetarian dishes, and that's why I always work with our service staff to tell, they're not vegetarian dishes. They're vegetable dishes, okay? Because it once you label it as vegetarian the next thing you know everybody says i'm not going to order it because i'm not a vegetarian when there are so many of our customers that do order our vegetable dishes because they like vegetables not because they're strictly vegetarian yeah those people got to calm down a little bit i think yeah Yeah. come on and we have i mean we have (laughs) vegetable dishes in the plant section of the menu that have seafood on them Mm -hmm. and it's 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 a dish about kohlrabi not about dried shrimp right? right and so I, th- I completely agree with you. It's not a vegetarian dish just because it's got veg- vegetables on it. Mm-hmm. We just uh, like that there's more plants these days right, in exactly. Chicago than, than beef and And meat that's potatoes. the way it should be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Dan Snowden, uh, hey. again, from uh, Bad Hunter. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. Yeah, great to be here. Great, okay. great to have you. Coming up next week, George Gervin would be proud. We're going to meet the Ice Man, or should I say Ice Queen. We don't sell to the consumer market yet, but we do have an awful lot of people come down here all the way down to back of the yards to pick up ice for their cocktail party or birthday or whatever they have. Some One guy shows up just because he loves whiskey and he stocks the ice and just drinks his whiskey. Out. The business of clear crafted ice for a burgeoning cocktail industry. And that's next week on our show. You can always contact us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at The Feed Podcast. And you can check out our ingredient challenges. You can get recipes and other information about previous shows by simply visiting our website, thefeedpodcast.com. And don't forget to subscribe and rate our show on iTunes. Be sure to follow me at Rick underscore Bayless. And I'm at Steve Delinsky with a Y. More information about the restaurants we talked about today on our website as well. Linnea Dominic's our intern. Max Delinsky supervised today's music. Bureaucratic wrote and performed our theme song. And the Feed Podcast is edited by Matt Cunningham at Truthful Enthusiasm. Whether you're an individual or institution, get your story online with truthfulenthusiasm.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Arrived at the meal late? Listen to back episodes of The Feed Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Search The Feed Podcast.